The plates shifted, tectonic plates shifted a bit today in British politics. We think of the Tories as the party of bigger defence spending. This morning, though, Keir Starmer said he supported a reversal of cuts to the size in the British Army. As things currently stand, uh, the army will shrink to 73,000. That is the smallest it's been since the Napoleonic Wars. That said, the government's increasing defence spending... Uh, just not on the British Army. In a recorded address to MPs in Kiev today, Boris Johnson promised £300 million to help Ukraine build up its military, uh, which obviously it needs to do right now, given what's happening there. Uh, Robert Fox, the defence editor of the Evening Standard, uh, joins us now to reflect on these uh, two, st two stories. We're sort of rolling into one. Uh, Robert Fox, well, welcome to you. We'll start with events in Ukraine, uh, obviously. £300 million. What difference do you think it's likely to make? It's very interesting uh, how selected, or selected rather, the list uh, of items from Boris Johnson. We knew a bit about them before they're sending in stormer vehicles, which can launch uh, these uh, rockets, both Javelin, I believe, but uh, more, to, more to the point, probably Star Street. Very useful, not too many of them, but in niche battles, which is what the uh, Ukrainians are fighting, very, very useful. Um, indeed. But it's the electronic warfare, the jammers and the sensors, and particularly the artillery uh, ranging and spotting uh, gear and the GPS jamming. This is really important. It's actually quite a revelation. We haven't heard so much about the electronic warfare, which I believe is proving particularly effective on the uh, Ukrainian side, just very quickly on artillery. The Americans and the Canadians have set, sent in their standard uh, long range 155 uh, howitzers, and they can outrange the Russian equivalent on the other side. And if with the Brit equipment you have for spotting the artillery, where it's actually coming from, you've got a formidable uh, arm, uh, uh, armament in what's known as counter battery fire something that you have a, you have a salvo coming in and you can immediately strike back and get the guns that fired the salvo. Funnily enough, actually, Robert, almost exactly this time yesterday afternoon, we were talking, interviewing a 19-year-old Cambridge University undergraduate who had suspended his studies in natural sciences. He was native-born Ukrainian. And part of his job, he was wearing a Ukrainian army uniform, uh, and he was telling us how his job, with his science background, was to, to do exactly what you were just describing. He was helping to put drones into the air, which were watching uh, the artillerymen of the Russian army and trying to find a way of hitting back at them. So, as you say, it's it, it's a change in what what they ha they have been spending their money or what's been available for them to to use to fight uh, the, the 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 Russian army. More more generally, to my first point about the politics of this, to Keir Starmer, um, you know, the traditional outlook is that the Tories look after defence spending. Labour rather reluctantly does. It was very interesting this morning, I think, to hear Keir Starmer say, when, when pressed on the Today programme on the BBC radio, he, he said he would look to increase spending, but also reverse cuts to the British Army. I think that's extremely interesting, actually, both parties have good and bad records in government on defence because the Tony Blair, first Tony Blair government, uh, launched um, the strategic, uh, the, 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 the first, the, the SDR, the Strategic Defence Review of 1998, which is regarded as a model of its kind. Uh, it was uh, launched by the great George Robertson. Now, Lord Robertson went on to be Secretary General of NATO. But one of the flaws that's always laid at that is that it wasn't properly costed. And this is the thing with budgets. And it's part of the problems of governance. By the way, I do not blame the Conservatives or the Conservative government, nor necessarily Labour. But there is a flaw, I think. I think the, the Treasury, which of course holds the money bags, quite understandably, but it has much too big a say. Suddenly, I've come across Treasury experts with the kind of academic background, educational background that I have, but have never heard or seen a shot fired in anger or an army deploy for real, which myself and my colleagues, I mean, the great Martin Bell, the extraordinary Anthony Lloyd, and uh, uh, people like Lee Stusset, uh, right across the board, uh, have seen. And yet they talk about operational matters. Now, the important thing about the defence reviews of last year 
and the Treasury are having a say about it. They do want cuts. And when you go for cuts and you ask a civil servant, they have to have a cut that bleeds. They always want to cut personnel because it, you can do it quickly. It is well, people are expensive, Robert. People are expensive. You, take, you hire a soldier, you've got a pension liability, something goes wrong, you've got to pay out. No, I'm cheaper than you, and I've been a journalist for 50 years. <laughs> cheaper, no pension. You could still no. pay for a cleaner for that study. No, it's looking no, the right no, state. No, no, no. What I really fear that came out was they were talking about lawfare, they were talking about integrated operations. I've been reading the speech by the previous chief of the defence staff, and I don't want to speak ill of the recently retired, but it was gobbledygook in terms of what is now required. And this is what Keir Starmer has spotted. The idea that you have to avoid the contact close battle where soldiers have to engage each other. And we had Alicia Cairn from the Foreign Affairs Committee announcing on a BBC programme, a free discussion programme, oh, we no longer need boots on the ground. And she said, <clears throat> sorry, I'm going back to incur a D notice here. We haven't got boots in the ground, on the ground um, in Ukraine. Per se, we haven't, um, in, technically. But untechnically, certainly, yes, we've got advisors and helpers and, and, and it is bound to happen. You cannot fight a battle without soldiers at the moment. You have got to be committed to that final furlong, which is called the close battle, the contact battle. And it's from the personnel. You build the flexibility to change what you're going to have to do. A soldier joining up for 22 years, if he or she still does now, will have to change direction at least three or four times in that career. You can't ask a machine to do that necessarily. And this was where I heard Keir Starmer, and for once he got it right, but I'm not entirely convinced that a lot of his front prep bench would go along with him. Robert, just in a word, uh, given that there's been this reorientation and people now perhaps are beginning to accept that you do need actual physical human beings, maybe even old-fashioned ideas like tanks, to, uh, to populate the battlefields of Est future battlefields, heaven forfend, of Estonia, etc., in a word, do you expect to see the defence cuts planned by this government the size of the British Army to, to be cancelled or not? I don't expect them to be cancelled. I sound like a wretched politician now. <laughs> I expect them to be reviewed and revised. If they want to take evidence, yeah, as I said, axios in journalism, why wars that I've covered, I'd like to give evidence about it because it's the fighting men and women time and again that have proved so good. The machinery at times, the procurement, the procurement policies have been lousy. Look at the whole uh, uh, fiasco of the Ajax light, light tank. Three and a half billion pounds spent so far and for nothing. But the soldiers are good. They are valued. And by the way, the advice of British soldiers and fighting men and women is so valued by the people we're looking at in your imagery, the Ukrainians. And they are learning from us and we're learning from them. It is absolutely exemplary. We have to ask our, 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 uh, the question with this, why has the whole concept of ground warfare by the Russians gone so badly wrong? Why are the Ukrainians doing so well and without giving the secrets of the game away where they don't have to?